Hello, friends, and uh, I assume you are tired, uh, both from January Jamboree and from the other state of affairs in the world. So you are at the right session. Um, you are at Universal Design for Fatigue, um, and I'm really pleased to have a very cool panel of presenters um, who have been doing a lot of work on this particular topic in terms of writing articles um, and doing other presentations. So I really am looking forward to this session. Um, I will be here as is Christina from the CoLab. So we'll keep an eye on the chat and you can always private chat me or Christina Stevens if you have any issues or questions, but otherwise um, I'm gonna turn it over to Nick to kick it off. All right, thank you, Robin. Uh, Kate, can you um, share the PowerPoints? I, th I think you've got co-host privileges. Yeah. You're, you're also muted. Yeah, you're good? There we go. All right, so uh, as Robin said, uh, you have shown up for Universal Design for Fatigue. If you came to uh, uh, jumpstart the first week in December, you may have heard me speak on this topic. Um, this is coming from a, uh, um, an essay that's under review currently uh, that I co-wrote with uh, Kate Kirby and Asia Merrill. Uh, back in December, you just had to listen to me talk about it and there was no time for Q and A because we were at the beginning of the day and we just sort of got wedged in with what time we had. Today, my co-conspirators are here and we have time for Q and A. Uh, so you'll be hearing, so fortunately you'll be hearing less of me and my fatiguing voice and more of their great ideas and we'll have more time to workshop this stuff together. Um, another thing that I think has changed is that when we wrote this piece in November, we were kind of looking forward to the winter break and thinking, we're really not gonna get a break. Things are gonna continue to be bad. We were, you know, um, uh, foretelling. Uh, and and uh, it's an easy proclamation, that was an easy uh, forecast to make because yes, things have continued to be fatiguing. I don't think any of us feel very rested over the winter break. 2020 is off to the same start that 20, uh, 2021 is off to the same start that 2020 ended with. Um, so we have this problem of, have, of all of us, students, faculty, staff having this debt of fatigue as we go into the spring semester, still under pandemic conditions. Uh, uh, Becky says, there is no break. Uh, 2021 is 2020 the sequel. Uh, the, the title of uh, our piece is, I'll put this in chat, uh, how to avoid spring 2021, the fatiguing, because it is like the worst possible sequel. Um, uh, Oh, we've, we've unshared. I think we're just trying to work out the live captioning. So she's ah, trying, I, I'm assuming she's trying one more time, but either way, just yep. uh, keep on going. How's about now? Um, I don't think the live captions are working. So I'm just gonna, oh, now they are. Awesome. Okay. Perfect. Be that, because tech, the role of tech is to embarrass us. It wants us to call attention to it and then it will work. It's only um, working for me. So I think we have to go to Google Slides. Okay. Okay, have you got that on backup or do you want me to pull it up? Um, I should have it here, yep. And I will just reiterate one more time for people who haven't heard me say this at every session. It has been announced that um, all of higher ed is getting Zoom live captioning on mm -hmm. January 24th. I do not believe that January 24th will actually be the date for anything, but it does see seem like it's coming really soon and that's gonna be um, a great addition for all of us. Yeah, it's really good they're working on that. Okay, so uh, Kate, you wanna, uh, yeah, go ahead and kick us over to the second slide and, and, and take us away. Oh, oh, let me back up a, a second before, before, we, uh, before we do this. I'm interrupting our moment of rest. Uh, so I think many of you know me. Uh, I'm Nick Helms, I'm new at PSU. I'm a British literature faculty. Uh, but Kate and Asia, could you uh, briefly introduce yourselves real quick at the, since we're getting started? Okay, um, so I'm Asia. Um, I'm an undergraduate senior English major and Spanish minor. Um, I met Dr. Helms through his Rethinking Medieval Literature class last semester, um, and we just kind of got talking about um, safeguards and fatigue and everything that was going on, so that's kind of why I'm here. Um, Kate? 
guys, sorry for all the chaos and also for the stress that all the tabs that I have is probably spurring in a lot of people right now. I'm really, really, really sorry. It's a really bad habit. Um, my name is Kate. I am a PhD candidate in a biological sciences at Vanderbilt. Um, and I was uh, thrilled to have the opportunity to meet Asia and Nick online, which is one of the really cool things about uh, being online um, is that we get to form all of these uh, relationships with people that we may not uh, otherwise meet. Um, and I like science, um, teaching, learning, and knitting um, to just give you a little bit about my personal life. Um, and so I'm just going to kick us off into that little moment of um, mindfulness. And so as Nick mentioned, um, we're gonna be talking today about fatigue. And so we thought that we should acknowledge the fact that we're probably all really tired right now and that we're not going to be able to resolve that with just a moment of a mindfulness, but we figured we would at least try. And so I'm, I would just like to ask all of us as you are able, if you can just relax your jaw and your shoulders, that's where a lot of us hold our tension and just take three deep breaths. So I'm gonna count us, take one, two, three. And so hopefully that's put us in a little bit of a, of a less fatigued space. Um, I just got a little lightheaded, so I'm going to hand it off to Nick. <laughs> All right. Uh, so um, we're taking our lead in particular from uh, disability studies, uh, in particular the work of Amy Homre, who's been beating the drum about opposing capitalist norms of productivity and slowing down teaching. So here's Amy Homre from the Imagine Otherwise podcast this past year. I recognize in my own life and in my activism the value of and concept of sustainability that comes from the disability justice movement. Sustainability is about being honest about our capacity and where we're at, about honoring the limitations that we may face in, time, in terms of time, energy, and just being alive at a time of a pandemic and in capitalism. Um, if we had been working in a completely humane, completely livable higher ed before the pandemic, we might be okay right now, but that is clearly not where we were. And so much of 2020 and now 2021 has been about maintaining business as usual, as usual, which is just not sustainable um, for our bodies and for our minds. And that's something that disabled people have been very loud and vocal about for you know uh, decades in terms of activism, but you know centuries upon centuries, um, that different bodies and different minds experience time and work in different ways, and we need to incorporate that into our course design, into our lives, into our expectations for ourselves and for others. Uh, next slide. So uh, some things we can talk about today how to proactively construct our courses and semesters to mitigate fatigue rather than contribute to it. Um, fatigue is a disability justice issue because it drains the time and energy disabled people need to care for themselves and their communities. Uh, can you kick it into full screen? Cause I'm not getting the captions right now. I think it's in, yeah, there we go, perfect. Um, fatigue is a student retention and success issue because it chips away at students' capacity to learn and to manage their time. Uh, I believe in re some recent cabinet notes, it was mentioned that the failure rate uh, at, at PSU from the fall was uh, double. Um, uh, is Robin's, Robin's yeah, nodding? Th those were my notes, which most people didn't see, but that's what they did say at cabinet, um, double the normal rate of Fs. Yeah. Uh, I. I I'm not gonna shock all that up to fatigue, but I think a lot of that fatigue is a component. Um, and finally, fatigue is a labor issue for students, faculty, and staff because the current public health conditions during COVID-19 multiply the already backbreaking work of higher ed into an untenable cycle of impossible expectations and burnout. There was already a mental health crisis for undergraduates and for graduate students and for faculty uh, in academia because of high workloads before the pandemic. Now, under these conditions with healthcare breaking down and overtaxed, taking forever to even get 
appointments with doctors for mundane things. Uh, we're at the point where we need more than just a little fl flexibility. We need different design and different expectations. Um, next slide. I think we're transitioning to Kate now. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you so much, Nick, and and thank you all for having us. So as I mentioned, I'm Kate. Um, I am a, a PhD candidate um, at Vanderbilt. I also serve as a, um, a teaching affi affiliate at Vanderbilt's Center for Teaching. Um, and I'm really interested in promoting equity in the classroom and so being able to uh, uh, write this paper uh, with Asia and Nick was really important to me. Um, and so I have incorporated practices from the disability community into my classroom and I'm going to, to talk about two of these um, concepts here today. And so the uh, uh, first of those is Crip Time, which Allison Kafer wrote about in, in her book, Feminist Queer Crip. And she describes Crip Time as a combination of a flexible standard for punctuality combined with the extra time needed to arrive or accomplish uh, something. And so essentially Crip Time recognizes that things pop up, mobility aids fail, appointments go over time or are hard to schedule. Um, or get scheduled or get started late, literal and metaphorical batteries run out of juice. And all of these have cascading um, effects onto all of our activities. Um, and in recognizing that every one of us has a body and that everybody has, has the needs, accommodating these needs can require a lot of flexibility. And so one ex example of accommodating the, these needs that, that might be really familiar to you is that we build breaks into longer classes so that folks can use the restroom because we all recognize that we all have to use the, the restroom. Um, and so it, it, in light of the numerous ways that our focus um, emotional capacity and our perseverance is being is being stretched uh, right now for pretty much everyone. Everything is taking longer these days, and so uh, we need to build in time that accommodates the, the, that need for extra time. Um, and I, I will discuss um, specific strategies that we can that we can use around that um, in a couple of slides, but. I want to kind of weave together um, this concept of crip time with this other concept of spoon theory. Um, and so a few d d decades ago, Christine Miserandino popular, uh, popularized the concept of spoon theory, which suggests that activities require emotional and uh, physical energy. Um, and uh, she was trying to explain this co concept while she was out to dinner at a restaurant with a with a with a friend, because uh, Miserandino has a chronic illness and was trying to convey that sometimes she just can't. Um, and so, in trying to explain that, that these activities require energy and that individuals with chronic um, illness or disability have a limited energy, um, they need to um, make choices and carefully plan based on the energy th that they have. And so in trying to explain this concept, she grabbed all of these spoons at the neighboring tables at the uh, restaurant and declared that spoons are the physical representation of this emotional and physical energy. Um, and so she went on to explain that some activities require more spoons than others, but that spoons are finite, that you only have so many spoons. And for example, at the end of a day, she may only have one spoon left, but she still hasn't showered or eaten or done the laundry. And if each of those activities require one spoon, then she has to pick which activity, uh, uh, which activity she has the energy for. Um, and, and so she might choose to forego doing 
uh, the laundry and showering so that uh, uh, she can eat because that's the most important thing uh, uh, for uh, her uh, body at the time. And so I think we can all recognize that we're all going through multiple extended tra traumas right now on top of whatever is going on personally and especially uh, based on the individual marginalized identities that we have. And so given that uh, leads uh, me to the conclusion that even those without chronic illnesses should be counting, counting and rationing their energy right now. And while I don't suggest that abled folks actually use the terms crip time and spoon theory because those do have very specific uh, meanings, I think they are useful frameworks to kind of think about your ex experiences and the ex experiences of your students because if your students only have one spoon left and they have to uh, choose if they're going to eat or do homework, they're probably going to have to pick eating, right? And so given that all of us are, are human beings with bodies, we can make assumptions that these practices will also apply to our students. And so um, Nick, are you handling the chat? Because it pops up and I'm not looking at it. Okay. <laughs> um, and so- Yes, you're good, keep going. Awesome. And and so um, I used a few strategies in a course that I taught over the summer during the uh, pandemic. And so I wanted to just uh, share a couple of those uh, with you here. And so uh, one thing that we can do is build our current lack of time and available effort and energy into the course. Um, and uh, some ways uh, we can do that is uh, recognizing that student investment, there, there, it, the, there is research that student investment can actually promote engagement. And so by providing students choice in activities or, uh, or assignments, uh, 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 we can promote their engagement and it may or may not alter the amount of spoons or the amount of effort that the um, activity then appears to um, cost uh, uh, for them. Uh, we can also encourage students to complete only parts of, a, of assignments, allowing them to pick and choose where their effort goes. Uh, for example, in the course that I taught over this over the summer, I used um, guided or reading questions associated with the readings before class every day. Um, and I asked students to complete just 50% of each of the guided uh, uh, readings. And so, so it allowed students to understand what the bare minimum of effort was. It allowed them to pick uh, which uh, readings that they were going to accomplish and still know that, that they would get full credit. Um, and I asked them to complete half of each assignment um, because it ensured that they engaged with each module at least a very little bit. That way they didn't leave the class completely unaware of one concept. Um, of course, students could could complete more than 50% if they wished. And oftentimes they did, especially when um, the content really resonated with them. But it, it allowed them to be really um, clear on, on, what, on what the expectations were and manage their um, effort uh, uh, um, accordingly. Um, given the fact that the pandemic has continued on and that there are additional other stressors uh, and then now I might even drop that down to only 25% of, of each reading to just get um, students to uh, engage at all. Um, and further, um, encouraging students to only complete parts of assignments acknowledges that work can always be improved upon and that growth is always possible and probable. So uh, focusing on the, the fact that scholarly work is always ongoing can help students engage with the material without feeling overwhelmed or like they aren't meeting your um, expectations. Which brings me to my final point, which is that done is better than perfect and that good enough is good enough. And so by encouraging students to just submit something and or engage with the material in some way, then students will engage in ways that work for them, that uh, 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 work for the energy level that they can commit at any given moment. 
And so by modulating expectations in this way, we may actually get more genuine engagement from students. And all of these practices can reduce instructor grading loads, which Asia will expand more on in her section. And so I'll pass it off to Asia now. Hi, sorry, I had trouble unmuting. Um, so yeah, again, I'm Asia. Um, and before I get started uh, with ungrading and high flex education, I just wanted to give you a little bit of context as to like what a typical undergraduate student went through in the previous semester during the pandemic. Um, and I want to emphasize that my experiences are in no way exceptional. They're more so the rule from what I understand um, and from what I've heard from my peers. And so um, on top of the, a full credit load um, last semester, I had three on-campus activities that were technically jobs. Um, two of them didn't require quite as many spoons. I had the writing center, which was about 10 hours a week. Um, and I had the clock, which was minimal, minimal spoons. Um, but I also had this uh, community advisor job where I was um, emotionally exhausted from trying to keep up these relationships with my residents and be a leader in my little community. Um, I was physically exhausted because we had duty shifts where we would have to stay up until midnight and all of these things would immediately put me at a disadvantage for the following day. Um, so maybe where on a day where I might have had 10 spoons, I now have eight, um, just to use the framework that Kate has been talking about. Um, so because of the pandemic, obviously the CA job, which is already quite demanding, um, was exacerbated. So we had extra concerns, um, extra paperwork to do because we had to be so strict with students. Um, they, when they weren't wearing their masks, that was a lot of extra labor and it was emotional labor as well because it was straining our relationship with them. And so that was exhausting in and of itself. Um, so I, up next, I wanna talk about like, what helped me stay afloat academically. Um, so if Kate will just move on to the next slide. Um, so in Dr. Helms's class, I had the pleasure of experiencing ungrading, um, which was a new framework. I had never seen it before, but for those who aren't familiar, it is it, it's a, it was a little radical in the sense that it almost eliminated numerical grading altogether. Um, and at the end of the course, like you received a letter grade because that's the framework that the university is using. But throughout, it was mostly just metacognitive processes and self-evaluation and a lot of uh, self-propulsion throughout the syllabus. Um, so it lessened the pressure of constantly producing work, which gave me the opportunity to engage with the content, maybe in a more passive way, but in a way that was more impactful for me. So it was almost more personal. Um, and it just, uh, it lessened the pressure, not only for me, but for my peers as well. Um, so the other thing about ungrading is that it removes personal biases. Um, one of the biggest things, one of the biggest criticisms that I've heard about American education is how subjective it is. So if you turn in an essay, it is up to that professor to give you a number, which is on like a sliding scale of how good that essay is. And that is subject to like, you know, personal preferences and biases and, you know, whatever. Um, so with this methodology, we were able to just submit something and if it met the standards, like the basic objective standards that we were given, then we were given a good grade or um, we were given credit. And something that Dr. Helms incorporated that I'm not sure is like standard um, for ungrading. Dr. Helms, you can challenge me on that. But uh, he had green light grading, um, which is where we would submit something. We were open to um, revise it or do whatever we needed to do to get it to meet those standards. Um, so there were no due dates and we had as long as we needed to meet that minimum standard and get credit. Um, what else? So the other thing about the removing gray areas is that it prevents pandering in our assignments. So I found that 
myself and other students would write things that our teachers wanted us to or wanted to hear in order to receive a grade. But without the pandering and without the grading, um, we were able to just sort of explore our own ideas and still receive full credit and not fear any um, blowback on that. So um, for example, like we had a blog post that was due um, and I just completely ran with this idea uh, that I had about the Greek references in Paradise, Paradise Lost, which is not super important, but it opened the door to discussion um, between Dr. Helms and I about the piece or the work itself, rather than me trying to get the right answer and get the good grade. And now I know more about Paradise Lost than I ever thought I would have. Um, so the relaxed deadlines were the most impactful um, for me because it helped me with time management. So with this, with our syllabus, we had a certain number of blog posts that were due at the end of the semester. And we could essentially um, do them when we needed to. Um, and so from the beginning, I kept up with mine pretty well. And then when things got a little bit harder because I needed to pick up another job to pay for school, I was able, I had essentially front loaded on all of my blog posts and I was able to engage with the content in a more passive way. Um, for a little while, which helped me save on time and energy. Um, so I think, what else? Oh, and there were plenty of challenges with ungrading. Um, and there are some pretty well-documented criticisms, but I would love to take that up with everybody during the Q&A so that I can sort of bounce off with you guys. Um, Kate, will you move on to the next slide? Okay, so the other thing that had a huge impact on me this last semester was the high flex education. Um, so for me, what I, like what I understand about it is it's the regular incorporation of Zoom as an element in the classroom. Um, and it enabled all students to attend class, whether it was then like when the class was happening in real time or a week from now or at that point. Um, so people who were working jobs to be able to pay for school, people who were in the military taking care of kids, they were all able to in, like, be in class and interact with the content as much as somebody who could show up and be in class in person every single day. Um, and it had a major impact. Um, even going back and studying for exams, you could literally just you know, have the recording of the class and go through it all again. Um, so that repetition was really helpful in actually learning things. Um, what else? It also ties into what Kate was saying about uh, spoon theory, again, to, to go back to that, because somebody who's chronically ill, it may take so much more to get ready to put their mask on, to worry about COVID, to go to class and, and uh, interact with people in person rather than to be in an environment that's comfortable for them and they have all of their needs met um, and still be able to go to class and have um, that sort of engagement. Um, and again, all of those stresses and anxieties are exacerbated by the COVID and like worrying about infection and everything. Um, but we could see that this present, presented challenges to our professors. So accommodating synchronous and asynchronous students, unresponsive classes, and uh, finding virtually interactive activities to do is, I think, like double the work. <laughs> and it, it's not fair. Um, so maybe that should be addressed. Um, but yeah, I think, I think that's it. Um, with that point, I think I'm going to pass it off to Dr. Helms so he can talk about what he has to say. <laughs> All right, so um, fun fact about me, I'm coming to disability studies through the very long side route of uh, working with madness and disabled characters in Shakespeare, and then looking for frames in philosophy and cognitive science, and ultimately being really dissatisfied with those, and, in the, and more recently coming to disability studies, um, sort of through the back door. Uh, if you can go ahead and kick over to the next, Kate. So, um, uh, this this is sort of my my gospel right now. A forty hour work week should be seen as the absurd upper limit of what we should expect from our students and by extension of ourselves. And I realize that's a radical concept for higher ed, especially right now. 
Um, but if we're not designing to a humane work week, inevitably we're creating overwork is, is I think the, the result. Um, and, and, I, and I'm not saying that that's a deliberate thing. I'm saying that that's, that's, a, uh, that's a byproduct of the way higher ed works and how higher ed works in this moment. Um, but that by considering how long things take, rationing time, and adjusting our expectations to humane workloads, I think we can go a long way towards mitigating fatigue, again, for ourselves, for our students, for those around us. Um, if you could kick over to the next slide, Kate. All right, uh, and so there are some extra uh, extra problems with this as well with calculating work. Like, I don't think that calculating work and determining higher ed as labor is a be all end all model, um, but it does push back against sort of like the over model of overwork by pressing by putting certain limits on it. Um, right now, work feels heavier in part because we're not re-energized by our passions and by social feedback. Um, our breaks and weekends are disappearing to public health concerns, pressing activism, and increased care work both in and outside of the classroom. Uh, I'm thinking about things that we have to do for COVID-19 on campus, but also caring for friends and family. Th those extra check-in text messages to your extended relatives who have caught COVID in other states, for example, that extra stress cuts into our ability to you know, move through the day. Um, just the facade, maintaining the facade of professorial professionalism, of just sort of like making it look like business as usual, which I think we're hearing from many corners. Um, I, I kind of feel like the newest version of that is, oh, the virus, the, the vaccine is just around the corner. Um, one, that corner is not next week. Two, even if we, even when a lot of Americans get vaccinated, we still need to be taking other precautions. A vaccine is not a silver bullet for this pandemic. Um, we still need to, uh, to be vigilant and that is still gonna cut into our, our energy reserves. Um, and not to mention, of course, Zoom fatigue, just the peculiar ways that technology is extra taxing for us right now. Um, uh, I've got more to say on this, but I want to uh, sort of like respect time and get us to Q&A as quickly as possible. Uh, one last thing I will say is that this sort of like pushing towards a 40-hour work week is below the, the Carnegie unit model um, in two respects. One, the Carnegie unit model assumes that a 15-hour uh, student is having a 45-hour work week at three hours per credit hour. Um, one, that's a 45-hour work week, not a 40-hour work week, which I think would be a better standard. Two, the average 40-hour work week for, the, for American workers involves things like breaks, lunches, time to sort of like care for one's body and one's mind during the process of work. To my knowledge, that the Carnegie unit model doesn't build those things in. Um, so we need to be shooting even below that to come up with, I think, humane standards. Uh, next slide. Uh, let's see. Oh, and we're not even beginning to talk about extra pressures that may uh, uh, apply to uh, students uh, of uh, certain marginalized identities of certain communities. Um, students who are working part-time or full-time to pay tuition, students who are facing food and housing insecurity, um, students, faculty, and staff of color for whom the ableist and capitalist productivity standards place an extra burden. Um, that in many ways, what we're talking about today, uh, mitigating fatigue, combating overwork is about pushing back against the norms of white supremacist culture. Uh, next uh, slide, please. All right, so some practical ways to combat fatigue uh, that have, I think have been working for me that I wanna improve upon in the spring and that I think that we can talk about in Q&A. Um, one is scaling back and automating feedback. Um, as valuable as grading an essay and marking every line can be, it's very time intensive and that is information and emotion overload for most students. Finding the, the moments to, uh, to, to, to make the few comments that are going to have the biggest impact on a student's progress as a writer, as a thinker, as a reader. Um, 
and making sure that you save the time and energy to give all your students that feedback. That's a more sustainable model. Eliminating disposable assignments. Uh, finding ways to um, make sure that assignments are driven by learning goals and by the purpose of the course rather than just to ensure compliance, ensure reading, ensure uh, that students have done a requisite amount of labor for the course. Make, make sure that all assignments are driven by purpose. Um, being open with students about your own fatigue and struggles if it's safe for you to do so. Um, that I think recognizing our own fatigue publicly with our students and what we're going through um, is a big way to lower the bar and keep students from driving themselves to burnout. Um, building in breaks for yourself and for your students, I think is gonna be a huge one this semester. We no longer have a spring break. Uh, and in a normal semester, a spring break seems to me barely sufficient to get us all through the end of the semester. Um, anecdotally, I think we've all seen that lag in energy post spring break when everybody comes back and they've just got, got just enough to get across the, 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 um, the finish line. During the interesting times in which we live as Asia has, and I have been talking about, um, even that wouldn't be enough. And we've lost that to a handful of of off days, build in holidays and breaks into your class, if at all possible. Um, so for example, in, in uh, as just a quick practical uh, example, in my classes, uh, they're always, I mean, it's literature, they're always heavily reading and writing focused. I build in three big unessay projects. And when those unessays are due, we take the week off from class Students are given that time to work on the project, and the only thing that they're expected to do on the clock, like uh, scheduled, is to meet once with me for 10 to 15 minutes to discuss their progress. So it's sort of a, it's a, um, uh, as uh, Nicole's talking about using the phrase brain break, like I think from the routine of the class, it's a brain break, a chance to catch up, a chance to uh, sort of like tie a bow on that unit of the class before getting back into the swing of things. Um, and I think that that's important. Um, other options include shorting synchronous class times. Like uh, the, again, that the, the, the Carnegie model ass assumes so many hours in class, butts in seats, so many hours out of class, especially when we're in this online hybrid mode. I think playing with that model of how many, uh, of whether those butts in seats have to be in front of the Zoom camera with their cameras on or whether they can be at home on their own time in their writing desk when they have the energy to do the work. I think that that's important. Um, and finally, and this is an extension of being upfront with this, have that basic needs syllabus language for flexible mental health days in your syllabus. Let students know upfront from day one that um, things are not business as usual. Um, that everyone is going to have bad days and that everybody is allowed to work through those bad days as best they can. Um, all right, so final slide, I think. All right, so in to, 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 to wrap this all up, we've been talking about learning from disability studies, about working towards a universal design for fatigue based on those uh, lessons, uh, about learning from student experience and letting that inform our, uh, our, our design. Um, ultimately to oppose the culture of overwork that is uh, rampant in higher ed uh, right now, especially during this time of pandemic. Um, so how can we best work to decrease work uh, for ourselves, for others, um, for, our, um, for our institution? So uh, Q&A time. Uh, we've got a small enough group. We all know each other pretty well. So feel free to just cut on your mic and jump in with a question. Uh, we had some questions in chat that we can go back to. Um, what are people thinking other than fatigue?
I'll I'll start. Um, for those who don't know me, my name is Jennifer Kamarowski. I'm a new uh, assistant professor in the criminal justice department. And I thank you, uh, Robin. I saw that you've put some really useful um, links and responded to my one of my comments with uh, making an appointment with Martha. But I just previous to this um, session attended Kayla Gaudet's presentation on high flex and it was really great and but I'm now I'm just I feel so overwhelmed I feel like you know I I've been putting a ton of work into my syllabus and you know sort of redesigning my research methods class based on what I learned from teaching last semester which is my only semester to refer to um and and now I'm just you know trying to think about my students and and doing what I can to accommodate everything and I just feel like there's uh yeah I feel a little unmoored right now <laughs> like there's just so much to think about and it's not that I don't want to it's not that I don't want to take this immense pressure off myself and off my students but I think about how much time I put in to date on working on preparing my course for this semester and preparing a syllabus. And I prepared a liquid syllabus, which is basically a website where students can just kind of go and interact with the typical mm -hmm. information on a syllabus, right? Like, so, uh, and now I feel like, oh God, I should change the whole thing because my syllabus is mm -hmm. white supremacist uh, capitalist bullshit. So, <laughs> no, I, so I, I am 100% I'm overwhelmed. There. I am 100% there with you. I, 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 I feel like it is absolutely valid to be, to feel like, feel overwhelmed in this moment. And like, this is a utopian premise. Uh, this is stuff that in my classes, I've been working on for five to 10 years. And e about every year I come in and I have that exact moment that you're talking about right now where it's like, oh my gosh, I thought I had, I, I thought I had cracked it. And now I've got this other thing that I want to redesign. Because honestly, I feel like the training that we get on average, and I'm speaking from the uh, from uh, the, the field of English here, but I think this applies more broadly. The training that we get, um, uh, oh, Robin says, if you think your stuff is white supremacist, capitalist bullshit, that means it is not. That is actually the test. Yeah, like we, the, <laughs> the, the default training we get for, um, teaching in higher ed uh, in recent decades uh, shifts towards this overwork model, shifts towards this implicit white supremacist model. And it's a lot of work to undo that, all of that training, the, you know, the, the, the norms of grad school, um, of, 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 of the roots that we have been um, uh, given, of the toxic mentorships that we have lived through. Um, like coming out from under the burden of that is a lot of work. It's not something that gets done over a, over a semester, over a January jamboree, over a summer. It's, it's, it's like, I think it's a, it's a lifetime of work for the entirety of higher ed. So picking your battles, picking your little things, uh, I think is exactly the right place to be. Um, I, and I think feeling overwhelmed by it is a recognition that you are doing the work and I think that it's paying off. Um, to, 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 to use a, um, uh, an odd analogy, it's like picking up a new instrument or picking up a new art. And at first you're excited because you're like, oh yeah, this is so cool, I'm painting now. And after a, a while you realize you suck. And that's because you've developed taste and you're developing skills and you become hypercritical of yourself. I think for a lot of us for teaching, we're realizing, hey, maybe we can do better in all of these ways. It's gonna take decades to, to reach the best. It's a utopian premise. I don't know, is it, was any of that coherent? Are, are people with me? Yes. Okay. And can I jump in too um, with the, you know, I wish we had a robust instructional design wing at Plymouth. Um, you know, in the past we've had as many as like four or five instructional designers. Um, we're down now to one who is Martha Burtis. Um, 
but a lot of times people don't understand what the role of an instructional designer is compared to a technologist, like somebody from IT, like um, Jason or something, because our job, and, and me a little bit, although I have a more of a coordinator position, um, but particularly Martha's job really is to help you sort through the enormous number of possible pathways for your course. Um, so the two things I would say is number one, remember this rule of twos that we keep bringing out at the collab, which is um, in some ways, Kayla Gaudet is the worst possible person to listen to because she violates that rule all the time because she is able to just take in so many different creative ideas, put them all together, spend, I don't even know how many hours like creating this stuff. Um, but we generally encourage you to think about two uh, paths that you want to develop or explore, two changes you wanna make in a syllabus, um, not more than that at any one time because you have the rest of your career to keep iterating on your syllabus. So I'd say the rule of twos and the others, I would say Martha, consider that a relationship rather than an appointment. With IT, you file a ticket, you get a transactional thing. With Martha, what we'd suggest is a half an hour intake. Let her know what you're overwhelmed by. Let her know what you're interested in trying and then make another appointment where you follow up. She's got all the tech skills, but she'll be able to help you sort through some of those choices because that really is kind of what her, her job is. So um, take advantage while we still have instructional design support at, at Plymouth for that kind of stuff. Thank yeah, you, the rule Nick of Martha's, that's good. Thank you both, Nick and Robin, that was helpful. May I comment too? Because I, I want to sort of springboard off what Robin is describing. Um, I'm a senior teacher here at Plymouth State University. I'm, I don't know, 31, 32 years, something like that. And I have seen so many cycles that we've gone through across this time and, you know, dozens of discussions about teaching frameworks and learning frameworks. And one that has helped over the years tremendously has helped me to be aware of my spoons and use my spoons effectively and efficiently and so as to not run out entirely is this old idea of the flipped classroom. And the reason it has worked in the courses that I've been teaching in health promotion, public health, exercise science, is it gives students time with me, not as in me as an instructor, but me as a mentor or a guide so in other words, figuring out ways in the instructional design where Martha could help you, where the students are doing the work outside of class and the time in class is spent relearning what they've already done or going over what they've already done or discussing what they've already done. I call it workshopping it, which means they actually do their homework in class. Because sometimes they, they just aren't, they don't have the personal structure in their lives to do that. They're taking a full 16 credits of courses. They're working 30 hours a week. They have a job as something else on campus. I mean, they're way overspending their spoons and they're doing it oftentimes just for survival. So it's like the time in class, it, it, it's almost their study time sometimes. And I've been amazed at how much really good work they get done when I've flipped the classroom like that. So. That's just one concept that I wanna throw out there that, and Martha's helped me a lot with developing some strategies for doing that. That's all. Yeah, I wanted to give a second vote for that. I actually mentioned that in the chat. Um, and actually the best way to do that I found was not to ask them to do readings, um, but was to actually take what had been my lectures and to annotate them, basically write on the lectures exactly what I would say for each slide, have them read that beforehand, do a quick summary and then spend the time being as active as possible. You know, the best semester I had teaching one of my courses when was when I had spent the time to plan that ahead of time. <laughs> and, and it really worked really well because the students were willing to spend, to look over 25 slides and a paragraph of annotation under each one and then come into class. Some of them would read some of the other things I'd posted, some wouldn't, but then come into class, we do a quick overview. The biggest thing I would say that made a difference was that I had a two or three question quiz at the beginning of class. Took under five minutes. You know, usually a word, maybe two words, just vocab, something that they 
even if they looked it over as quickly as possible, would have gotten. And I think it held a lot of them responsible. And for some of the students who weren't good ex traditional exam takers, it was a low enough bar that they didn't feel intimidated by it and were able to, to you know, help their grades that way. So I would, I would give a second vote for the, the flipped classroom in a modern, creative way. Yeah. Uh, thank you for that, Heather. Uh, Bill, and, and Barbara, building off of that, uh, something that I'm experimenting with at, at the tail end of the fall and I want to lean into more in the spring. And this is uh, 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 directly coming from what Kate said about flexible assignments and student choice. Um, in my classroom, again, reading, writing, heavily focused, um, I'm trying to tier the readings and to say like, okay, if you're completely swamped this, re this week and you just can't, please try to at least read these 10 pages. Like that, like, like, like the, my expectation is you're gonna read all of these things that are assigned, but start here. If you're drowning, just get through this much. If you can, if you've got more time, read this additional thing. If you're loving it and you're having a good week, read this third thing. Um, but just sort of like giving students a roadmap for where they're, when they are white knuckling the semester and just trying to hang on, what do they need to focus on most? Um, where does their attention need to go? Um, and I like that with the idea of the, um, of the short uh, quizzes with uh, key concepts, sort of saying like, if you, you know, which to me sort of says like, if you've noticed nothing else, here are the things that I want you to pick up here. Um, because again, as Kate was saying, uh, learning is a lifelong process. Uh, projects, writing, uh, uh, the things that we write um, are long-term projects that require constant revision. Um, so teaching our students that uh, mastery of these concepts isn't uh, the complete objective. It's diving in it's learning something, it's getting more comfortable with the material. It's not something that they're going to encompass in a class's time, in a week's time, in a semester time. It's, a, it's, it's part of a journey. Um, Matt, you've Nick, unmuted. Yeah, Nick, do you have any thoughts on how in, man in allowing students the freedom to manage their own time, you don't turn that into uh, a time crunch of your own um, with students, for instance, turning in a lot of work at once when you're not really ready for it. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, that's an excellent question. And honestly, something I'm still working with. Um, I think that building your semester in such a way that um, uh, like I, I built mine in thirds with three major projects rather than relying on the big final project and the big final at the end. I don't do finals. I just do those major projects. So that automatically sort of like splits the grading load up. And while, yes, I absolutely had a crush of makeup work at the end of the semester. Um, one, I, it wasn't competing with finals because of that structure. Um, so, so I had sort of, sort of already built that time in for me. Uh, yeah, as, as Barbara says, front load semesters, don't, uh, don't, don't back load semesters. Mm -hmm. um, uh, two, um, I think I, I sort of like, I, emotionally, physically for myself, I budgeted that this semester because I knew some students were going to need that. Um, like I, I was looking ahead and saying like, I'm going to dial back on some responsibilities because I know this crush is coming. That's not sustainable for every semester. It just, it, it, it but it felt important uh, this semester. Um, three, and I, I've got some language in my syllabus to this effect. Um, beyond a certain date, uh, I'll say, oh, uh, uh, Robin's comment. Was it someone at PSU who did this? Turn in by A date, get extensive feedback. By B date, get less. Works best and revisions are permit permitted. I don't know where I, I, I think I got that from y'all. Matt's Maybe saying he's it was, done that. Maybe it was probably yeah. Matt because he's nodding. I'm I like, did. somebody yeah. had this idea. Yeah, I absolutely stole that and then forgot it was from Matt. So thank you, Matt. Um, so I, I basically had like a five day period at the very end of the semester before grades were due where I said, just turn in your work. I'm not going to get to give you feedback on it, but I will give you credit if you just make it across the finish line. Um, so, so, which I thought student incentivized students throughout the semester. If you get things in in a more timely manner, you're going to get that 
uh, that, that back and forth with me, you're going to get that feedback. You're going to get timely comments from your peers. You're going to get to engage with peer review. If you do an 11th hour, you're still going to squeak across, but you're going to miss out on that community, um, which um, again, it's, it's sort of like the utopian premise of ungrading. It's a different way of looking at incentives for completing assignments. Um, but I'm pretty happy with the way it's turned out thus far. Yeah, mine came from a desire to be honest with students about my time as I want them to be mm -hmm. honest with me about theirs. And so I just tell them when, you know, how those sorts of things work and what my schedule looks like. Yeah. Um, we, we do have time probably for one more final question or thought, um, but another session is going to start in this room right at three. So does anybody want to ask a final question or um, leave us with a, a parting thought? How do we get the administration to buy into the 40 hour week work week? <laughs> Great question. I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> Thought I'd give everyone a laugh. <laughs> yeah. It's a fight. It's definitely a fight. Um, but, and again, I like, like, or the nine month contract, Becky says, yeah, like. <sighs> Your AAUP organization is working on that as we speak. And with that, I'm going to end recording. <laughs>